All right. Welcome, everybody. This is our fourth attorney lecture series that we have this year. And uh, unfortunately, this had to get postponed a little bit, but here we are. And happy to welcome Scott Broussard, who's a local attorney here in Fort Bend in the Houston area, who's been practicing in family law for a number of years. And uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to him and he can take it away. Thank you, Mr. Andrew. Um, what we're gonna do here today is, is try to give uh, an A to Z uh, outline for those listening to follow uh, handling a pro se divorce or a divorce without a lawyer. Now I do need to say this, this is not intended to, my lecture is not intended to be me giving you legal advice in any way. It's more to discuss the procedure, the methods, the manners, and the hurdles you might incur doing this on your own. Uh, that's very important because there can't be any concept or any thought that an attorney-client relationship has been um, established here. Further, uh, while there will be a QA, I'm assuming, Andrew, is that correct? You're, you're, you're not on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, absolutely. We'll have a right. Q&A thing at the end. So if you've got any questions, please hold them to them. Right. And we want to stay away from anything specific and factual because you could be sitting yourself up where you have, you don't have an attorney client privilege to protect some of the things you may say. And frankly, your spouse might come out and try to hire me. So I'm not really looking to hear anybody's specific facts that might be going on. Um, everyone good and everyone hearing me? Uh, Andrew, you want to check in, make sure everyone's hearing? You're off again. Yeah, we're, I'm hearing you fine. Okay. Yep, I hear you. Let's okay. see. Uh, okay. okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, so it looks like we might have a smaller audience here. But the first thing that you need to understand when you're going to handle a divorce yourself is a divorce is a lawsuit. It's just like anything else. Instead of calling you plaintiffs and defendants, however, we use terms like petitioner and respondent. Now, the reason I, I, I want to impress upon you that it's a lawsuit, because everything that happens in a lawsuit has to, everything procedurally happens in a divorce. And the number one thing that, that everyone needs to understand and know is whether or not the county you are attempting to file your divorce in is the proper county. So we have two things there. We have what we call jurisdiction and venue. Now, jurisdiction just means which court you're hearing in. And in Fort Bend County, we have three family law courts. So that's easy enough. However, before you can file a divorce in the state of Texas, you have to have resided here in the state of Texas for six months and in the county of Fort Bend for 90 days. If you have not met those qualifications, you cannot file a divorce in Texas. Now, I'm going to tell you just generally that if you don't know the location of your spouse or if your spouse resides outside the state of Texas and is uncooperative, handling a divorce by yourself can be extremely difficult. Uh, and we'll go into why that is briefly, but it, it might exceed the scope of this. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're going to draft your petition for divorce and your petition for divorce is your lawsuit. And in that, I know they have forms at the library, it's gonna ask, what do you want to do, basically? Um, you know, are there kid issues? You're going to check. Yes, we need to be conservators. Conservators is fancy terms for parents. Non-parents can be conservators, but it's rare. Um, is there property? You have to say yes. If you have separate property, something you own before the marriage, you need to identify that in your petition. These are all check marks that you have to, to do. Once you have filed your petition. There's two ways to serve someone. Well, actually there's three, but the third way is a very difficult way. First, you can pay a constable or a clerk, rather request from the clerk, that a constable go out and hand your spouse divorce papers. That's called formal service. 
Um, if your spouse is cooperating, you can do what's called a waiver of service, which is a document you can get in the library that would accompany your petition. And the waiver of service is just something that your spouse would sign under notary to say, hey, I acknowledge there's been a divorce filed. If you haven't done one of those two things, you will never get your divorce finalized. Service has to occur or the person has to sign what we call a waiver of service. Now, here's something that I always find people or see often when people are trying to handle a divorce themselves. Before they even file the divorce, they go to their spouse with waiver and service in hand and say, hey, sign this waiver of service. Then they file everything together. And the judge will say, no, nope, that's not proper service. And you're like, well, wait a minute. He goes, no, nope, service has to be after the divorce is filed. You cannot, for, for legal reasons, it's, it's putting the cart before the horse. So don't make that mistake. I see plenty of people, they think they've done everything right. They're trying to get divorced. And the judge looks at it and says, wait a minute, they signed this service and the divorce hadn't even been filed. So how could they possibly waive it? There wasn't an action pending. So again, when you're going, if you're going to get a waiver of service, you need to make sure you filed your divorce first. And then you hand your spouse the divorce papers and the waiver of service. And again, this is the pleading. These are not the final orders. This is just, I'm asking the state of Texas to grant me a divorce. So that, that circlet highlighted, if you're taking notes, service is the number one error that I see in pro se divorces. Now, if you don't know where your spouse is, you're gonna to have to ask the court to do what's called a waiver of service. I'm not gonna get into it here because it's, it's entailed and it's difficult, uh, but that's gonna be the, the, the MO. If your spouse has never resided in the state of Texas and is not gonna cooperate with you, the divorce, they can grant you a divorce, say you're divorced, but they have no jurisdiction to divide the assets. They can make kid rulings and they can grant the divorce, but they cannot divide your assets. So know that. So if you have those two situations, you have a spouse that you don't know where they're at or a spouse that's never resided in the state of Texas and is not gonna cooperate with you, you're going to have a difficult time handling the divorce on your own. I'm not saying you cannot do it, but you're gonna have a difficult time. So now let's talk about we have filed our divorce. We have either, um, served the parties with papers or they have signed a waiver of service after having received the notice of divorce. You then have to wait 60 days unless there's some outrageous emergency that would warrant you getting divorced before that 60 days. And that can be, you know, you can say, hey, I'm leaving the country, I'm going out, I'm being deployed or whatever. There are things like that where a court will consider. But by and large, for the most part, you have to wait 60 days. Now, your divorce decree is what you're going to have to draft next. And it can be very entailed and it can be very detailed. Um, and generally, I would say 70% of a divorce decree is boilerplate uh statutory legal language that needs to go in there. Yes, we have jurisdiction. Yes, we have venue, warnings, things of that nature. If we don't have any children under the age of 18 that we're dealing with, you're just going to be dividing property in a divorce. And when you do that, you have to be specific about the property that you're going to be awarded. If you're, one of you is going to take a home, you need to put the legal description of the home in your divorce. If one of you is going to be taking cars, you need to put the VIN number of the cars. If one of you is going to be dividing bank accounts, you need to uh, redacted numbers, but put the bank account numbers in there. But what you put in an order has to be specific enough for someone to enforce it. In other words, if you just say uh, all cars in his possession, 
And later on, y'all are fighting about who got this one car that y'all didn't identify. The judge is going to have trouble doing that. If you're later trying to transfer a title to that car because it might be in someone else's name, you're going to have trouble doing that. So you need to be very specific in the assets that you're going to award. And if you then have children, now we're getting into another realm that's going to be very complex. The state of Texas has what we call a standard possession order. And the state of Texas presumes that the parties should be joint managing conservators. And that's a fancy term for co-parenting. I hear lots of people say, well, I want to be the sole parent. Well, to be the sole parent, you're going to have to put on some strong evidence, even if your other parent in there, as to why you should be. Because the court is going to presume by law that it's in the best interest for parents to be joint managing conservators. Now, joint managing conservators doesn't mean you have the children equal amounts of time. Joint managing conservators addresses rights and duties with the children that are statutory and you're going to have to address in your divorce decree. One parent is going to be, well, just for slang, we'll call it the weekend parent, but one parent's going to have first, third, and fifth weekends, 30 days in the summer, alternating major holidays. That's presumed to be in the best interest of those children. So if you, and that parent is generally going to pay child support as set by statute, set by law, which is a percentage of someone's net take. If you do anything outside of that realm, then you're going to have to explain to the court why the possession schedule you want is in the best interest of the children. And I'm going to tell you, most courts don't like to see a one week, one week, or two days here, two days there. Most courts don't like that. So if you're going to do anything beside that, or if you're going to ask that a court restrict or supervise someone's periods of possession, you're again going to have to put on evidence as to why that is. This person has a drug problem. This person is uh, violent, things of that nature. And if you don't do that, the court is not going to give you um, what you're requesting. Additionally, the court is going to want to know, uh, is going to want language regarding health insurance in your divorce decree and who's going to pay for that health insurance. Typically, the person who pays child support also pays health insurance, and any uninsured expenses will be split equally between the parties. If there's no insurance available for the children through either parent, uh, the courts can have a problem signing that. One, you either need to apply for state assistance uh, with health insurance for the children, or two, the court's going to force the person paying child support to go out and buy an insurance policy for the children. So just know that if you try to go to court without insurance in your divorce decree, the court is most likely not going to sign your divorce decree. Second, if you try to go to court and you change in anything other than what we call a standard possession order, the court is going to grill you a little bit about why that's in the best interest of the children. Uh, if you've got a fireman's schedule or something like that, they're going to accept that. But if you, and it depends on the judge you've got too. But, but for the most part, the courts want to stay in that little box. They don't want to get out of it, and they want to follow a standard possession order. If you agree to someone paying less in child support than they legally should, the court's going to want a reason for that. And your reason might be, well, you know what? I'm doing okay. They're struggling. I want them to have a little bit more money over there so he, he or she can have a nicer place when the kids are with them. But you need to have an answer for that. Okay. Now, again, I know a lot of this is like drinking from a fire hydrant. Um, I'm sure if I'm sure I could fix anything on my car if I got on YouTube and spent a week looking into it, <laughs> but I could pro and probably bring it to a mechanic and have it done in two hours. Uh, so a lot of that is what you're going to be faced with when you're doing your own divorce decrees. But here's the things makes don't, don't get caught up in making procedural errors. So now let's say that our 60 days has passed. 
Um, I'm not sure what the pro se dockets are. I think Andrew probably has a schedule of what the pro se dockets are. Um, but you're going to have to sign up on what we call a pro se docket, uh, uncontested docket. And on that day, you're going to, uh, I don't know if they're still allowing pro se litigants to uh, walk, walk uh, divorce cases in or if they're making you e-file them. But you're going to have to file your proposed divorce decree with the court. If your spouse has signed it, great. And you'll show up that day and only one of you needs to show up. And there's about seven questions that have to be legally asked for the court to grant your divorce. And those are, the court has them. It's a script. Uh, it's going to say, you know, I was married to so-and-so on this date. We stopped living together as husband and wife on this date. I have been a resident for the state of Texas for six months and the county of Fort Bend for 90 days. Uh, the marriage has become insupportable. Uh, and it's, it's something like that, and you're going to be done in five minutes. However, the judge is going to be looking through that decree to make sure that the trappings that I just told you about are, are not, uh, not in your decree, that we do have health insurance, that we've addressed possession schedules, that we have addressed um, who's paying child support. Because these are gaps that it's going to stop the judge in his tracks. Um, judges don't like blanks in divorce decrees either. So, uh, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you have, you're getting a Chevy truck, but you don't have the year, he, might, he or she might stop and go, what make is it? But again, I would put VIN numbers in those types of things. So here's the, the second biggest problem I see when people are trying to get divorced on their own. They have um, filed their divorce. They have served the spouse. 60 days have gone, and the spouse has not filed an answer. Okay? At this point, you're going to be asking the court to grant you what we call a default divorce. Now, remember what I'm talking about. The spouse has been served. This, if you haven't served the spouse, you're not getting anywhere. You've served the spouse with divorce papers. Okay? And... They won't answer. They're not cooperating. They're not signing their divorce decree. They're not showing up to court. You're going for what we call a default divorce. In other words, you're saying, judge, I need you to grant me this divorce. He's not cooperating. She's not cooperating. They're not here. There are three very important things that are prerequisite to granting a default divorce. First and foremost, you have to file an inventory an inventory of your assets. Now that, I don't mean we have three couches, two TVs, etc. It means give the court an idea of what major assets you have and what their values are, including your debt, right? She so might say, well, we have a, a home um, that the equity position is $100,000 and we have a retirement account that the equity position is $100,000. I'm asking the court to give me the home and give him the retirement account. Well, you need to have that inventory because what a court cannot do and will not do just because someone has shown up is give you a hundred percent of everything. They won't, they will give a just and right division of the marital estate. And the only way they can know what a just and right division of the marital estate is, is if you give them an idea of what your marital estate is and your marital estate is your, assets minus your debt. Okay. And I would imagine that there's a, a sample inventory at the library also where you, you know, one column is going to say, here's the asset, here's the asset value, here's the debt. I want this awarded to me, etc. Okay. But that is a prerequisite to filing a, um, a default divorce. The next document that you have to have, and it, it sounds silly is, um, a non-military affidavit. You have to draft an affidavit, and the, uh, everything I'm talking about is in the library, that says to the effect, to my knowledge, my spouse is not in the military. It doesn't mean you've got to go out and call the Army, call the Navy, call any branch of the military. That's why I think it's kind of silly. Um, but you may say, to my knowledge, my spouse is not in the military. Bam. If the judge asks you, how do you know? Say, well, he's never been in the military. She's never been in the military. Um, they're past military age or whatever. Uh, they're still on Facebook. Um, 
The, sec the third thing you will need is what's called a certificate of last known address. And that's where you are saying under oath, the last known address of my spouse was this. Now, if that last known address was your house, that's it. But if you know that they have moved in with their mother, their father, their brother, their sister, and know that address, you need to put that in a certificate of last known address. Now, again, we are talking about a default divorce. This is not if y'all have agreed and signed on it. You don't need any of these things. It's when your spouse is not cooperating, they have been properly served, you will not be granted a divorce without those three things. And I see it, I see it. Once a month in the courthouse, the judge says, you need a non-military affidavit, you need this. And then people start asking the judge, and the judge says, I can't give you legal advice. Okay? So that is kind of the anatomy of the process of the divorce. And if you miss any of those little things, it's going to be very frustrating for you. So recap, the first thing we're talking about, do you have jurisdiction to file the divorce? Are you here? If your husband or spouse, uh, wife has never lived in the state of Texas, you're going to have some problems. If they're residing outside the state of Texas, you're going to have some problems getting them served. I can't tell you that it's not, you can't do it. I'm just saying it's going to be difficult if they're not cooperating. Remember, if you sign, if you ask your spouse to sign a waiver of service, you have to file the divorce before you ask them to do that. Otherwise, how can someone waive something that's not in, not in existence? The divorce isn't even in existence if they sign a waiver simultaneously with you handing them what you intend to file. So you have to file your divorce first, then hand them the divorce and the waiver. Okay? You then have to wait 60 days in the divorce decree. If you're dividing property, you need to be as specific as possible. As specific as possible. If you're going to have children in there, if you don't want to be joint managing conservators, and again, that doesn't mean 50-50 with possession of the kids, you're gonna to have to put on some evidence as to why that other spouse should not be a joint managing conservator. And that evidence is gonna be, gotta be pretty damning. It's gonna be drug abuse, alcohol abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, record. And it hadn't been around the kids for five years, those types of things, no interest in the children. Um, the divorce decree will, the judge will not sign it if someone's not paying child support to the other person, unless you can give a good reason. Judge, I make $120,000 a year. They make $25,000 a year. If they pay me child support, I don't need it. If they pay me child support, it's going to lessen the place perhaps they could live in. It's going to be harder on my kids when they're with them. I'd rather them not have it. Uh, I don't ever find it any advisable not to ask someone to pay child support. Frankly, I feel like this is just my personal belief. If you're not going to make them pay child support directly because you don't need it, you take that child support and you start a 529 for your kids. Um, but anyway, that's, that's a personal choice if you want to do that. And if you're going to do it, you need to give the judge a good reason you're not going to do it. Also, a judge is not going to sign an order that doesn't provide for health insurance for the children. The person who pays child support pays the health insurance premium. Uninsured expenses are split 50-50. If there's no insurance available and they can't qualify for uh, state-assisted insurance, then the judge is going to say, mom, dad, one of you who's paying child support better go out and buy a separate policy for the kids. Now you're 60 days down the road. If you got your spouse to sign off on an agreed order, that's easy peasy lemon squeezy, right? You're just going to go down there and you're going to read seven questions, seven statements into the record. The judge is going to sign your divorce decree. If your spouse has been properly served and has not cooperated, has not filed an answer, um, you're going to need to go through the three steps of what we call a default divorce. And I think that's about as thorough as I can be, Andrew, unless you want me specifically to address an idea that you come across I've got one, and this comes across us a lot. Um, it's, it's dealing with, more likely it's uncontested, and it's not necessarily, you know, they're arguing over issues or what have you. But the mm -hmm. 
And they're like, oh, somebody told me I need to file a counter petition instead of just an answer. And, and so what's your thoughts on that? Is, is, is a petition more effective or not? Well, um, all right. So a counter petition, if you're in agreement, probably doesn't need to be filed. If you are in disagreement and you're asking the court to do certain things, you can't ask the court if you don't have a counter petition on file because you don't have what we call pleadings on file. So if you're going to try to handle it yourself and you're going to be the respondent, you've been served, which I haven't addressed it from that angle. Um, and you say, no, I want custody of the kids and you need to file a counter petition. You say, no, I want the house. You need to file a counter petition. You say, hey, I've got separate property. I had $100,000 in this account before we got married. You need to file a counter petition. If you just file a general denial, then you better be in agreement with your spouse on every other issue. Because otherwise, you will not be able to put that evidence in front of the court, especially if your spouse has a lawyer. Because you'll be up there and you'll say, well, I want custody of the kids. And, judge, and he'll look his objection, you know, no pleadings on file. See, general denial doesn't ask for custody. If you say, uh, you know, I want, and the judge might give you some leeway, but legally they're not supposed to because when you don't have a counter petition or, you know, pleadings on file, pleadings, I'm pleading, I'm asking you to do this, judge, think of it that way, then the other side's going to say, we don't know what they're asking. We have a right to know what they're asking, and they never filed that, judge, so you have to ignore it, and they are completely right. OK, the general denial will certainly help. It certainly help you if you all are in agreement. Um, it'll help because um, some courts, even though you've served someone and I disagree with this, but you've properly served someone and then they've signed the divorce decree. I had a judge say, oh, I'm not going to sign that until they file a general denial. And it was ridiculous. And I won't talk about what judge did that. Uh, but it, it, was, it was nonsense. It wasn't required. The person had been served and they signed the agreed order. Um, so anyway, that's something that, that, yes, if you are going to handle this yourself and your spouse has filed on you, you absolutely, if you're in, in disagreement uh, and y'all aren't reaching agreement, you better have a counter petition on file. Okay. Jonathan, do you have any questions that you want to ask? No, it's been an excellent presentation. It's uh, confirmed a little bit of what we do, and which I'm glad to hear, and 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 gives us uh, just some additional pointers from at least from our perspective of things. So so far, okay. excellent. Thank you, Mr. Broussard. Yeah. And I will say these two guys here that uh, uh, can help you all out uh, are probably two of the kindest guys I've seen who are very patient because I overhear them in the library uh, assisting people all the time, and and frankly. I sit in the courtroom sometimes and see people struggling. I want to get up and say, if you'll just do this, you know, it'll, your problem will be solved. And uh, it's not, it, you know, it's not my position to do that, but you can get a lot of assistance uh, from the Fort Bend Can County uh, Library. There's also legal aid. I don't know what the conditions are, the requirements uh, to apply for Fort Bend legal aid. I'm sure you've got some information on that at the library. We do. Um, but um, you, you pretty much, you got to have a pretty good hardship to qualify. I, I do know that. Uh, they're not going to give you legal aid just because you don't want to spend money on a lawyer. And lawyers are extremely expensive. Uh, that's not lost on me. Um, but um, sometimes uh, I've had people three years later call me that only had their spouse represented. Uh, their spouse had a lawyer and they didn't. And I wouldn't do this, but the lawyer pulled some tricks in that divorce decree that, um, you know, the other person just, okay, I'll sign it. And I'm like, judge would have never ordered you to do that. The judge would have never agreed to this, but you signed it. So you're stuck with it. Right. So be wary of that. If you're going to go through a, a divorce decree, uh, a divorce by yourself, uh, because you don't have the money to do it. I get that. I, I get that. And I, I empathize for you on that. But if you got the money, uh, it, a lot of times it's penny wise, pound foolish uh, not to do that. And you could spend more money years later trying to correct the errors that should have never been there. And I'm dealing with it right now. 
Uh, I have a guy who is paying so much more in child support than a court would have ever, ever ordered him to do. And he's not paying it directly, but wife he's paying all these other things, you know, that adds up to about twice what he would have to pay in child support. And we're trying to get that undone. It was clearly an abusive um, decree, but, and, and the guy had money, but he was being, uh, I'll just say, uh, He's being frugal with his money, <laughs> but he had more than enough money to not make the mistake he made by having a lawyer say, don't sign that. So all of you need to be careful about that. If your spouse has a lawyer, um, unless y'all really don't have a whole bunch to argue about, um, you know, then you really need to look at a lawyer because uh, uh, you can make some mistakes. The other thing I will tell you, um, all of you listening, I don't know any lawyer that, well, there might be some. You, you, because I've had these calls before. Someone says, "Well, listen, I've done it all myself. I just have this divorce decree. Will you review it for me?" I personally won't do it. Um, you know, will you review it for one hour's time or two hours' time? I won't do it. There's several reasons I won't do it. One, it's just not good business for me, and I'm I'm in business to make business, so I'll just I'll, I'll say that as selfishly as possible. Um, Two, it's a problem for me because I haven't handled your divorce at all. And now I'm giving you my blessings. And later on, you find out that, you know, there was more money that your spouse hadn't disclosed. And, oh, well, you're going to sue Scott because Scott didn't warn you about all these things. And so it, it can be a real trap for lawyers to just review your documents and give them a blessing. Uh, and I can tell you, since law school 30 years ago, I was advised never to do anything like that. There are some lawyers that might do that for you, um, but but you're going to be hard pressed to find them. Hey, you know, Jerry. one, thank you for your kind words, Scott, and uh, we appreciate it. And um, I want to say one thing, just echo what you said, you know, we, we get people in here sometimes, you know, who signed off on stuff and it's horrible for them and they're trying to undo things. And, you know, I know we try to just, to, you know, friendly advice to people, admonish them to, you know, as boring as it is, read through the documents, make sure you understand it and agree with it before you sign it because it's hard to unring the bell. And it's like reading Latin sometimes. I mean, it's, it's literally like reading another language. So I'm saying, you know, these buzzwords, conservators, just insert the word parent, right? <laughs> uh, you know, petitioner and, and respondent, plaintiff and defendant. Um, it's, it's, it just, it, it can be taxing. It certainly is doable. It certainly is doable on short marriages with no children and very little assets with an agreeable spouse. But the other things where you have a disagreeable spouse, an absent spouse, uh, major assets, uh, retirement accounts, I would, I would say you're, you really need to be a very, a very bright person to figure out how to, handle retirement accounts um, because uh, there's plenty of us lawyers that still make mistakes uh, trying to divide uh, retirement accounts. It, it can be a, a pitfall. So. Well, we're running out of time here. So if anybody else has any questions, we can switch over to the other Zoom. Otherwise, thank you very much for coming. Andrew, if you need to log me back in, let me know. Will do. Thank All right. you, thank you guys. Bye. Bye.